Um, so Nick's role at UKCEH continues to be in river hydrometry and he's going to share with us today um, the latest advances in hydrometric methods and some of the new things that are coming forward. And really with that very brief introduction, I should like to pass you on to our honorary <laughs> secretary, Mike Cranston, who will tell us about a little bit of housekeeping and, and so on for today's webinar. Okay. And I think it's rather a wonderful thing. You find these things on, on Twitter and wherever, but this sort of paleo channels from, from LIDAR data from, from some researcher in the, in the US, but fantastic stuff. Anyway, thanks very much, Nick and, and Mike for introducing and for, for allowing me to come here and talk. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm two and a bit days into my new uh, position at, at CEH. So, you know, whether this is wise to be taking on this kind of presentation so early in my career there, who knows? I, I guess it's uh, sort of uh, a great triumph or, or a great disaster, hopefully the, hopefully the former. So, um, yeah, we've called this uh, hydrometry for a climate emergency. Seems sort of timely, seems sort of exciting, whatever. Um, now, I, I assumed everybody was familiar with the colours um, that form the, the, the letters there of, of my title. Um, but for anyone who's not, they're from Ed Hawkins. Um, they're his climate stripes. You'll more commonly see them as a, as a solid sort of banner of, of colour. But, you know, the basic principle being is a timeline represented by colour. Um, blue equals a, war a cooler year. Red equals a warmer year. And surprise, surprise, we're moving into warmer years quite significantly. So, um, so yeah, that explains that. Um, and now let's see if I can advance my slides. Um, and move things along. So here we go. Yeah, so um, I, I just started my new job. Um, I asked, asked my boss, do I have to use the, the CEH slide pack? And, and he says, oh yes, that's very important. Um, so, so here it is. So this slide is to illustrate that I now work for CEH. Um, but now normal service will resume because uh, with 80 something slides, I didn't have a chance to give them all the CEH look. So, so for anybody who was at the BHS celebrating hydrometry event last year, um, this is kind of an update on that. Um, it's kind of where we're going with hydrometry, what's new, what's exciting, uh, and so on. So um, here we are. There I am last year, um, you know, presenting live at, uh, it was somewhere in London, I forget where. Um, and we had this rather striking sort of image of, of the shark, which I've used again today, uh, which came from James Bevan, our, the chief executive at the Environment Agency, who, who talked about the jaws of death. And I thought the jaws of death were rather nicely illustrated by a shark. Uh, but this was about growing population and diminishing available water resources. Um, so one of the key drivers, I think, for, for our science in terms of understanding how much water there is in the environment. So um, kind of moving on. Yeah, Harry and I, I, I I'm now reporting to Harry Dixon at CEH. Harry and I had a chat on, on Monday about what we're doing. And, and we thought it rather nicely sums up as hydrometry 2.0. Really, what we want to be doing is, is, is setting out a hydrometry, river measurement, um, river of hydrological observational tools um, for the future and, and trying, to, trying to move things on significantly. Um, so who am I? Well, Nick's given a, a brief introduction, but yeah, um, a hydro nerd for a climate emergency, I've called myself. But, but yeah, I've been working for 33 years at the Environment Agency, um, doing hydrometry in the field at first and then leading on some of the flow measurement methods, um, been engaging internationally increasingly, um, and I think have still retained a huge amount of childish enthusiasm for, for my topic. So hopefully some of that will come across um, positively in this presentation. Um, now I could spend time telling you what I'm going to talk about, but then I wouldn't have so much time to talk about it. So um, these are just a few words that sort of summarize the things I think are important and I get excited about. Stuff like more, better, new, collaboration, floods and droughts, gadgets like drones and phones, satellites and boats. Um, oh, collaboration appears twice, probably because I think it's important. Um, but what else is significant? I think what we're doing is important. I think hydrometry is very important. And, and I think it's great if we can make it fun as well. So, um, you know, hopefully that comes across. Um, these are some of the rules I'll be breaking in this presentation. Um, I have far too much content. I will talk far too fast. Uh, there'll be far too much opinion in this thing. Um, there'll probably be a slight scattergun approach largely because I woke up at four o'clock this morning and, and thought of a whole load of new stuff I wanted to throw in and didn't really have time to do it, but I did it anyway. Um, so I'll probably eat into the time for questions. So, you know, rules will be broken, but, you know, just hang on and, and enjoy it. So water, um, this, 
this is a slide I found from, from USGS. It, it was publicly available. I don't think I pinched it illegally or anything, but, but for me, it's a very nice summary of, of why what we're talking about is so important. All the water in the world is, oh, I found a laser pointer thing yesterday. What's that? Here it is. Yeah. Hopefully you can see that. This is all the water in the world, this little blob here. Um, and this one is all the fresh water in the world. I should have revised this, shouldn't I? This is all the fresh water in the world, but lots of that's in, in sort of um, groundwater and in uh, swamps and, and that kind of stuff. All the usable water in the world is this tiny little pinprick here. So it's really, really not very much. It's a small amount of water. So our ability to quantify that, to observe that accurately, through hydrometric tools and techniques is, is really important. Um, in fact, I would state, I'd go as far as to state nothing is more important than water. It's our planet's most, most critical resource. So why have I got a picture of the inside of a fridge? Um, I, I don't know whether Jamie Hannaford is, 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 is in this call, but if so, he might remember this one. This is a conversation we've had for the bloke outside a pub in Birmingham after a BHS meeting in 2014. Um, and this guy challenged us to, he said, well, you know, what do you guys do? And we said, oh, we, we measure water, we're water scientists. And, and he said, well, why do you do that? What's the value in water? Water's not a kind of valuable resource like oil or, or whatever. Um, and, and so we challenged him to go back to his hotel that night and think about what, how, how he'd get on if there was no water in the tap, no water in the shower, no water in the toilet. Um, he, he didn't quite seem to get it. But uh, we then went on to say, well, what do you do, mate? And he said, well, I'm developing intelligent internet connected fridges. So he said, imagine if your fridge knew if you wanted bacon because uh, you were and you were running out, it would order you some more bacon. So anyway, an interesting contrast. He's, he's probably earning many multiples of my salary by now. But I would argue that having something to drink is more important than having a fridge that orders you bacon. Um, and it's really stuck with me, that thought. Um, so bringing it back to something vaguely relevant to the title. Um, have we broken the climate? Um, you know, we're all aware that the climate is changing. I don't know, there's something in me that, that's, that's kind of felt like, you know, this year is a bit different. You know, things really are showing signs of, of, of being broken. So some of these images across the right hand side here, I think my laser pointer is working again. Um, you know, we went from, I think it was the wettest February on record in, in many parts of the country to the driest and sunniest spring we've ever seen. Um, there were the huge fires in Australia the heat wave in the Arctic where 100 degrees Fahrenheit was exceeded for the first time. Um, and then what, I don't know if it's been confirmed yet, but this suggested new high temperature record for the whole planet of 54.4 degrees C in Death Valley in the US. Um, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. So um, yeah, I think possibly <laughs> we, 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 quite, we might now say it's broken. Um, anyway, the consequences of this, you know, why is this important to us? Well, I think in the UK and probably many parts of the world, the impacts of climate change are going to be felt most significantly through water. Um, so, you know, that's going to be extremes. It's going to be extremes of floods. So floods are a bad thing and I think seem to be getting worse. Here's some of the opinion. Um, and droughts. Droughts are also a bad thing and seem to be getting worse. Um, so, you know, and these are the extremes. These are difficult to measure. So having effective tools to measure them is important for us. Um, another trend that I, I think is, is, is apparent, and a couple of my CEH colleagues were, were making reference to this a couple of weeks ago in, I think it was a BHS Pennines talk. Um, they didn't have the seesaw that I've got here, but, but I got these graphics from the wonderful um, Water Resources Portal, if you haven't looked at that, do. Um, but the point here is that we seem to be, there seems to be more of a trend for a kind of seesaw thing from very wet conditions to very dry conditions and vice versa. Now, I don't know if technically that is a trend, but, you know, my perception is that it's a trend. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it was a stark illustration. The graphics here represent uh, February on, the, on the, the, the blue one on the left hand side of the screen. And gosh, was it April or May? Yeah, May. It says it's labeled. I should read my own slides. Um, by May, a completely different picture. You know, we went from record highs to record lows in just a couple of months. So the ability to, to observe that and understand that is crucially important. So um, what about this rather beautiful um, slide? Is it beautiful, isn't it? I don't know. Um, if we were in a room, I could point at you all and say, what does this actually represent? Um, if you think you know what it is, well done. But what it actually is, is the World Economic Forum um, Global Risks uh, Graphic. And, and the significance of it is, um, 
different years are represented up, up, up the screen, so 2020 to the top, but environmentally related risks are green. So the point is, we go from 10 years ago, there were no environmental risks in the top 10, as recognized by the World Economic Forum, to almost a complete uh, greenwash, if you like, by now. So, you know, this is a bunch of economists, politicians and business people, whatever. They reckon environmental risks are, are the biggest we now face. So um, to illustrate what those actually are, climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, natural disasters, water crisis. So, you know, what we do is important, no question. Um, this one I, I pinched from Richard Maxted's rather wonderful um, BHS Pennines talk. I hope he doesn't mind. I think I asked him. We certainly had a discussion and, and we were colleagues at the time in the Environment Agency. So, um, but really, you know, what you see there is a table of high water levels that have been observed on some of these rivers in Yorkshire. Um, and the different colours represent the flood event to which they relate. Um, but an awful lot of those relate to flood events that happened this winter. So, you know, the point there is all of them have happened in the last 15 years, um, but an awful lot of those happened this winter. So lots of new record highs just this winter in that area. Um, yeah, the, this, this whole sort of jaws of death thing, um, diminishing water resources is one part of this equation, increasing population is the other. Um, so this is roughly the UK population about now, and here's what it's forecast to be by 2050. I hope you can see that on your screen. Um, from 67 million to 75 million, a big increase. I used font size to sort of, sort of represent that uh, proportionally. So a lot of increase in population, more people at risk of flooding, more people needing water in their taps, um, you know, more pressure on the environment, basically. So moving on to the more sciencey stuff, the more kind of the technical stuff, the hydrometry stuff, extreme floods, many established methods can be hard to, to measure. Uh, or rather extreme floods can be hard with, with established methods. I'm sounding slightly nervous and, and, and anxious here because my next slide contains a video and that's always a scary thing. And I think I've still got the sound in this video, so you probably won't hear me for a little while, but, but this video, if it will play, will it play? Oh, come on and play. It's a very nice video. It's not playing, gosh darn it. Let me see if I turn off this pointer. Here we go. Sit back and, and enjoy and be terrified. Uh, taking it slow down here to go across on the, on the cable car because we're not certain that there's plenty of clearance between the bottom of the car and the top of the water. So how much current is there, Wes, underneath it? So if, if you can still hear me, what these guys are doing, they're trying to do a river flow measurement using something called a manned cableway. So they put themselves in this little shopping basket and winch themselves across the river. And they should be... 10 meters or so above the water, but the flood is bringing the water level very close to the bottom of their cable car. The relevance of this being, these are the methods that were still in use until very recently. And I think this flood illustrates why new methods are required. So I would not want to be in that cable car. I don't know if you would. I probably should have trimmed the video slightly, but here's where the water actually starts to come in to the cable car that they're stood in. Scary stuff, I think you'll agree. So let's see if I can move on to the next slide. So yeah, um, the point really there is that you, you don't want to be going out there and measuring that. You don't want to be putting yourself or any instrumentation into contact with that kind of flood flow. Um, it's pretty terrifying stuff, life-threatening. Those guys were probably lucky to get away with their lives. And thanks to them for sharing that because I don't, I don't think I would have shared it if it was me. Um, but anyway, another illustration. Um, what this is, I mean, we're talking about flows you don't want to measure. So I think I'm interested here in not just measuring river discharge. You know, we're interested in measuring extreme flows as well from whatever source. And this is, um, most of you probably heard of the dam failure that happened in the US in May of this year. It was a relatively small dam, way smaller than the Tobruk Reservoir Dam. Um, but the destruction that it caused there is evident for all to see. So if we want to try and measure these kind of things, we need new methods. 
we need non-contact methods. That's that's the point. Um, so moving along and high flows, the value of capturing high flows is, is, is way more than just getting a point in your rating table to understand that the discharge. It's it's to inform the design of flood defenses, which can cost a lot of money. So um, Ed Henderson was, was kind enough to let me use this slide, um, which I think illustrates the point. So, you know, flood defenses were designed to contain a one in 200 year flood, um, but they were overtopped. The question is, of course, you know, did we understand the flow correctly? Did we understand the relevant water level associated with that flow? Were the defenses built correctly? Um, I have no reason to suspect there was any error made, but the point is you need to know the flow that you're trying to defend against. It's really important. Big investment decisions are made upon that, based upon that information. So it's really important information. So here's some slides that might look familiar to a few people on the call. Um, it's a little bit of a sort of trot through established gauging methods. Um, so here's a gauging we're in Northwest England operating. Uh, it's taken quite a few years ago, but it's operating as it should. The flow of the water is, is measured over the, or the water level is measured and we can calculate flow from that. Um, but in Storm Desmond, it looks something like this. And this wasn't the peak. The peak of Storm Desmond was halfway up the building. Um, so it's just not performing. It's basically a, a whole valley full of water at this point. And that tiny little weir is not having, it's not just not working. It's not converting the level into, into flow effectively. And this is the hut. So if you look at that slide there, the water level was, was about five meters deep on the bank. It was extremely high. Um, the uncertainties associated with flow calculations at that site in those conditions are extremely high. So apologies for hopping from slide to slide, but I want you to understand the, the context. Um, another tricky site in the Northwest. So the other thing to know is that's one of the most important sites. It's one of the high priority sites on the River Loon up in Northwest. Um, here's another one. Um, again, a very tricky site to measure out. Different conditions, the same river, but here it's much more of a sort of upland condition, fast flowing wide water, very difficult to get a decent measurement from. So those are our kind of challenges that we're looking at on the high flow side. So now a little brief history lesson on flow measurement techniques. Again, if you've seen me present before, some of these slides will be familiar, so apologies for that. Um, but we used to do this, we, we would hang, if I can get that pointer back on again. There we go. Yeah, uh, this is the current meter, little propeller meter turned by the flow of the water. And this is the sinker weight that would hold it down in the water. And we moved it across the bridge using this Derrick thing here. We'd lower it down into the water, do a measurement and so on. And it was time consuming. It was hazardous for us. It was hazardous to road traffic. It was hazardous to people using the river. It was also quite time consuming and boring. Um, we also did this kind of stuff. And this is me as a boy hydrometrist on the front of the boat. We had a seven meter long pole here. It had five current meters on it. We had a cable stretched across the river, if you can see it just here. So this was stretched across and winch tight. And um, so we had to close the river to traffic effectively. Um, this is a low flow measurement, but we would do this in the highest of flows as well. So although it was fun when I was young and stupid, it was very dangerous. It was also very slow. We would have someone on each bank in order to lower this cable if we needed to, and three people in the boat. So it took a lot of people, took a lot of time. Um, so then we progressed. We progressed to the ARC boat and ADCP. Um, in my time in the Environment Agency, I was responsible for developing the ARC boat with HR Wallingford um, and a great solution. Uh, this is one of the highest flow measurements we've done on the Lower Thames at Staines, I think this is. Um, and it worked great. You know, we're now getting the data in real time by a Bluetooth link from the laptop, um, from the boat to the laptop rather. Um, and compared to what you saw back there, it was about 15 times as efficient. And, and most importantly, nobody went out in the river anymore. We would stay behind the safety fence uh, and the boat went out there and, and, and dealt with the, the dangers of the flowing water. So a great improvement. But it's not going to cope with those kind of flows that we just looked at. It's not going to cope with the big storm. Um, this you'll be reassured to hear is me photoshopping this. We didn't actually lose a boat here. Um, but this is the kind of thing that was likely to happen. I think the site's up in, in Scotland. I think I've got it see if I get a lovely picture. Um, so yeah, we've looked at these kind of very aggressive surfaces. We've understood that we need to get these measurements. So how can we do it? So um, we've said we don't want to put ourselves or instruments in, in contact with the water. So non-contact methods. Um, basically, if the water wants to destroy your sensors and perhaps you, it's best you don't give it a chance. Um, and this very nonchalant looking chap here is, is from, uh, from our equipment organization now in, in Iceland. 
Um, and I believe this is a glacial outburst flood. So this is where the, the, the heat of, of, of um, volcanic activity melts the glacier that sits on top, fills up a big bubble of water and it bursts and you get a colossal flow. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to stand quite so close, but uh, yeah, they're very brave in Iceland. But the point is, how are you gonna measure that? You can't measure that with a boat. You can't measure that by wading. You can't measure that by putting some guys in a little shopping basket across the river. So you need another method. Um, so surface velocity methods is, is the one we're looking at and, and that a lot of people are looking at around the world. Um, and the reason we have the Winnie the Pooh slide here, it was a member of the public when uh, we were in, in my EA days, we were testing some of these methods on Wallingford Bridge and a member of the public having asked what we were doing, um, explained, well, it's just fancy poo sticks, isn't it? Which it is, you know, uh, we really, we're trying to understand the speed of flow of the surface of the river in order to calculate discharge. Um, so I don't know if I have the slide that explains this. I don't, I'm not sure I do, I think I took it out. But obviously, if you know the surface velocity, there's a few other things you need to know as well. So you're well on your way to discharge from surface velocity. You're gonna to need to know the cross-sectional area and you're gonna to need to know something to do the relationship between the speed on the surface and the speed further down. Luckily, we can relatively easily get the surface, uh, the cross-sectional area, um, particularly from our ADCPs, but for from other survey methods if necessary, and from our ADCP data, of which we have many thousands of, of ADCP measurements now, we can do a good interpretation of the surface velocity compared to the mean channel velocity, so that we can actually make something sensible out of out of, of a, out of a, a reading taken on the surface. The reason I've used an orange, anybody with experience in this field will know, is the orange is, has, has traditionally been the hydrologist's favoured tool for this because it sits nicely in the water and is highly visible. It's kind of biodegradable as well, isn't it? But, so yeah, we're learning from Winnie the Pooh and his friends. So image-based velocimetry, camera-based methods uh, are one of the key methods that um, are being explored around the world. Uh, and the way it works is basically you're looking for movement in successive frames of video. So basically, if you can see movement on the surface of water with your eye, so can a camera and a computer algorithm. What I've done here to help you with this slightly is I've taken two images that were taken a fraction of a second apart, I think something like 0.2 of a second apart, um, and I've used a different filter to help you distinguish um, features that we saw on one of them with the other. So you can see these green blobs, you can see the purple blobs. Basically the green blobs move to the position of the purple blobs, so we can see, we can see that the river is flowing in this direction, um, and by being able to figure out the distance between those parts, those two objects, or those two positions rather, we can work out the flow speed. So we need to scale the imagery, that's the challenge. We have to scale the imagery, which can be done, but for an oblique view like this, it's relatively complex. So we'll look at some other methods that make that slightly simpler, um, such as using a drone. So when you look at this here, you can understand hopefully that imagery close to, well, the bottom of my screen, close to the camera, um, the pixel size will represent a very different portion of the river surface, scale of the river surface, to a pixel that's way back here because of perspective. Um, so it's more relatively difficult to, to compare pixel sizes with on the ground sizes. If you have a drone and you're looking straight down, and this is, some, this is a still from a video shot in Iceland, I believe, of the same outburst flood, because we're now looking straight down at the surface of the river from a relatively great height, um, I photoshopped the drone into this just for the sake of, of the image. But you can see, you can now calculate discharge just by knowing the width of the river. You can scale the imagery just by knowing the distance from point A to point B across the river. And then when you calculate your velocity vectors, the error that you get due to distortion is relatively small because you're looking straight down. So it, make, it much simplifies the process. So I think I did process this one myself. The, the vectors give you the direction of flow, they give you the, the magnitude of flow, and we had a peak velocity of 4.6 meters a second there. Um, the guys in Iceland actually, I believe, bought the drone on their way out to do this measurement. So, you know, they, they were able to, to capture the data very, very quickly. Processing it was a bit more involved, but gave very, very good results. So drones can be a big benefit. Um, so we have a couple of pieces of work ongoing around the UK looking at these methods, these, these camera-based methods. This particular one is with the University of Worcester, um, with the researcher Sophie Pierce. Um, so she's looking at the use of drones for improving our ability to do discharge measurements, but he's also looking at wider and broader applications. 
So here is a nice illustration of velocity mapping. So she's taken the drone, hovered it above a weir, uh, and of course you get pretty complex flow structures downstream of a weir, but video from a drone can be processed to give you a pretty good insight into that flow structure. Um, and there's a few other people interested in this kind of thing. So fire and rescue, and the police are interested. Um, I met some guys from fire and rescue a couple of years ago at a conference, and they were really excited about the ability to understand the speed of water that they might have to go into to try and rescue people. And if you think, say, of a flooded town or a community, if you can get a drone up in the air and you can look down and in, in, in real time, ideally, but if you can swiftly process video into some indication of water speed, probably doesn't need to be centimeter per second accurate. But if you know it's two meters a second in this street, and half a meter a second in that street, you know which way you want to go. Um, the police are also quite interested in this kind of stuff because they're often, often interested in the fate of objects that fall into water. So, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, people or, or, or perhaps, perhaps animals, but also stuff, you know, vehicles, you know, things people are trying to get rid of. Um, so knowing the velocity and how it moves down the water course can be quite valuable to them as well. Um, flooding from intense rainfall, this is a piece of work led by Newcastle University, part of a wider piece of work, um, I think based out of Reading. Um, but what they've done for us is they've installed these cameras. They're basically kind of um, CCTV type cameras. Um, they've got infrared on them as well, so they can work at night. Um, but they've installed eight of these around the UK, um, typically in areas with faster flowing water. One of the limitations of these methods is going back to whether you can see the flow of water. If you go and look at a river like the Thames or the Severn or, or many lowland rivers in times of low flow, it's not that easy to see the flow. So a camera finds it difficult as well. But if you've got a fast flowing river, particularly with a rough surface, it's much more easy to distinguish. So we've started this research in the kind of catchments that are going to be more favorable. So this one is, I think was, this one's Todmorden, I think up in, in Yorkshire. Um, but yeah, eight of these cameras installed. So interesting to see what results we get from them. Uh, there's a new researcher there, Martin Jolly, who's been appointed in the last six months or so, working with Matt Perks on this um, and doing some really nice work, very interested in innovating and trying to, trying to take these methods, which currently are, I, I would say, on the transition between a research um, domain and being operationally practical and making them simple to use and, and operationally useful for us. So, you know, really exciting piece of work. And on that same theme, this is, this is a piece of software, which, which is, is really nice. Um, when we started looking at these methods, processing the results from the video into something meaningful, was relatively complex. It, it was doable, but it was difficult without somebody with experience to guide you. This piece of software from Coburg University actually makes it really quite simple. It's a really nice structure to it. You can see along the bottom, it, it's got a nice workflow. You go, you open your project, you, you scale your imagery, um, you do the velocity analysis, uh, and you process into discharge. It works really, really nicely. So the point here is, I think part of my theme at the EA and part of my continuing theme working at CEH is, is to take stuff that we see in the research and sort of blue sky thinking or whatever and, and make it simple, make it user, user friendly and effective for operational use. So uh, yeah, making things simple is important. Um, yeah, just to illustrate again, the sort of potential of these methods and get you thinking about the possibilities. Um, this is actually still from a video. Um, it's at Glen Reading in the Lake District, which is the, which is the village that was hit so badly during the Storm Desmond floods. Um, uh, this wasn't during those floods, but it was a relatively high flow event. A member of the public shot a video, put it on Twitter, uh, and we thought, well, can we process this and get flow out of it? Um, unusually for a member of the public, they, they shot what most people would say was a very boring video because it was 20 seconds with their phone situated in the same place, looking in the same direction. But that's what we want. To process for, for flow, you need a, a fixed viewpoint, whether it's an oblique angle or looking straight down. It needs to be stationary. What people tend to do is go, wow, look at this and pan around. That's not what we want. So, so they shot 20 seconds of video. I sent a link of the Twitter post to, to my friends, um, Frank in Texas and Mark in Australia and said, can you process this into flow? Um, how did they scale it? They just went to Google Earth and, and worked out the width of the river. So yeah, we've still got to deal with this oblique imagery thing, but they could get some idea of where the, the bend in the river was. Um, to scale it in that dimension. Cut a long story short, they both came up with a result within about 10% of each other. 
uh, and, and fully close to what we believe the truth was. We didn't have, I'll admit, we didn't have a reference reading, but we had a pretty good idea of what it should have been. Final part of the jigsaw was we, we did a Google image search and we found a lot of photos of the river when it was almost dry. So we could get a good idea of the water depth and the bed roughness. So we had a lot of information, all of which came from the internet uh, and a guy in Texas and a guy in Australia were able to process this video and get a meaningful discharge figure. So citizen science, I guess, is what we're getting at here, and the ability to process remotely from nothing but a video. Um, so this, again, this should be a video, if it will play. Will it play? Or oh, I've got to turn off this laser pointer. Let's see if it will play. It's playing. I hope, you're, I hope the, the video is, is playing fast enough or your, your screen is refreshing fast enough to see it. This is thermal imaging. So this is from a couple of guys in, in the US working at Cornell University. Let me see if I can play it again. If you look at the slide in the middle, the panel in the middle, you should hopefully be able to see vague, indistinct shapes moving down the river. I, I liken them to sort of cauliflowers or cabbages or something. But, and what these are is turbulent flow structures. Um, and, and, and they become visible to us because of the thermal imaging camera. So what they did was they put the thermal imaging camera up on a crane looking down at the river and they shot video with this thing. Now it was a pretty high spec camera. Um, I'm kicking myself because I didn't make a note, but the, I think the camera cost either 30,000 or $300,000. Um, if it was 30,000, actually, that's not that expensive for, for monetary equipment. If it was 300,000, then I'll have to talk very nicely to Harry before he lets me buy one. Um, but the point here, to me, this, this is really exciting. This, this can work when you don't have visible features on the surface. It can work at night. It provides an incredible insight, I think, into the turbulent flow structure of the river. Um, it also gives you a really accurate and believable um, reading of, of velocity. So I think it has great potential for low flows, it's great potential for rivers with smooth surfaces. So um, really, really keen to learn a bit more about it. Unfortunately, the COVID crisis meant that the guys who were meant to come over this year weren't able to, um, but we, we wanna learn more from them because we think there's great potential in this. Okay, so surface velocity radar. So looking at, still thinking about surface velocity, uh, a really simple tool that we bought a couple of years ago and have been learning about ever since is this radar gun. So it's, it's the little thing you see this guy holding. Uh, if I can move to the pointer again, and climb my way back. Yeah, here we are. Oops. It, it looks like a hairdryer. It's the size of a hairdryer. It's basically a modified police speed gun. It works really well on rough surfaces. Gets a Doppler shift from the surface proportional to the water speed. You, again, you need to know the depth. You need some relationship between surface and, and, and mean channel velocity, but we get that from our LECPs. Um, so a really effective tool. We tested it in Cumbria earlier this year. Got some really nice solution, uh, really nice measurements at a couple of their problem sites that they really needed measurements from. We did some comparisons elsewhere with an ADCP, um, just to give you some idea. The velocity profile from the ADCP are these strings of dots. And then we've simply put the SVR reading at the top, surface velocity reading at the top, uh, and, and they continue the trend very nicely, which gives us confidence that it's working well. So a really useful tool. Um, and the reaction you see here is, is the reaction of the guys when, when we realized we've got a result within 1% of our ADCP measurements. So we did an ADCP measurement, we used the SVR gun, and both were within 1% of each other, which was remarkable. But it, it goes to show it's a tool that works well. Um, so looking a bit further afield into space, what if we could measure floods from space? Um, those pe people who know me will, talk me will hear me talk quite a lot about a guy named Mark Randall, who's done some really, really good, he's an expat, but he's done some great work out in Queensland where he is now. He told me he reckoned we could measure flow from space, which, which kind of blew my mind. Um, he then got hold of a video of waves breaking on a beach and, and proved that it worked. Um, so we've then been trying to persuade somebody to give us some video from space of a river. And, and what you see here, if I can make it play, is just that. Um, oh no, hang on. This is a video, if it will play. It's not very exciting, it just sort of meanders around. But what blows my mind is this is a video that was shot from a satellite in space. And it is a video, it's not just a still. Uh, and the pixel size is about 0 0.5 meters. Um, the mark reckoned there was a good chance of us having a high flow in this river at the time this video was shot. And we were confident we could process the velocity if we had the high flow. Unfortunately, we didn't get the high flow, um, but we did get the video. We had a play with it. 
And these are some velocity vectors that we, we worked up from that video. We, I'll admit, we don't know if they're correct, but they look kind of believable. They're not 200 meters a second, and they're not two centimeters a second. So they're kind of in the ballpark that we expected, but, but we weren't able to validate them. But we believe flood flow measurements from space are now a possibility, certainly on big rivers. Um, yeah, just to give you an idea of pixel size stuff, uh, this is from another provider. This is Maxar, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, so you can see the structure of, of uh, the wake behind these boats to give you an idea of the resolution. Uh, and just to give you another idea, these are the commercial high resolution providers on the, on the left hand side, if you can see. Um, on the right hand side is a 15 meter pixel size that's more typical from some of the NASA and ESA outputs. Um, at the Environment Agency, we have a contract for drone video footage to be shot by a contractor. Um, we've encouraged them to try and shoot some video looking straight down for us, and this is one of those videos. Point being, we were able to take that and process it with no other information and get a really meaningful output from it. This, when I processed this up, um, the results were bang in line with the ADP measurements we've got, the reference measurements we've got during the River Seven floods earlier this year. Um, learning in lockdown, this fun thing. Um, again, this was Mark Randall. At the start of lockdown, Mark realized we were all gonna be stuck at home and wishing we could go do some field work. So what Mark did was he, he provided us with some virtual field work. He placed 11 videos um, and all the necessary information, the net metadata we needed, or 10 videos, sorry, up on our, on our, on our Yammer network and, and challenged people to process and, and see who could do the best job and which software was best. Uh, and it's been a really interesting piece of work because five different software tools have been used, 11 people have been having a go at it, and, and I think the analysis at the end will be really interesting to see how the different methods compare and the accuracy of the results. But really interesting, really nice, making it fun. Here's one of the outputs from that. I think the point here, after the first five rounds, we noticed a slight tendency. I can get the laser pointer and move it around. There was a slight trend for results to, here we go, sorry. Yeah, you see a lot of minuses. There was a slight low bias in the first couple, not really in the third one, not really in the fourth one, not really, a little bit of a low bias in the fifth one. Is that a trend? We don't know, but we've got enough data that we can start trying to understand. Um, more broad stuff. Um, I'm always very interested in how we can broaden what we learn about our rivers, particularly with, with single um, deployments. So what you see underneath my arc boat here is actually a multi-parameter water quality sonde. Um, in a mount built for us by CEH. Uh, and here's some outputs from it. This is from a river in Spain. Um, and what you see here is water temperature on the left and you see pH on the right. And there is actually a confluence with another river here coming in. So you can see very clearly the impact of that, of the different water quality coming in from that river and different water temperature. The two degree C change in water temperature at the surface as that river comes into the, towards the other one. And um, that's combined with detailed bathymetry and velocity mapping because we have the ADCP on the boat as well. So our ability to start to understand the river as a holistic system is increased enormously. Uh, this is a survey we did on the River Kennet. Again, talking about these surface velocity tools, we've got everything we need here to enable their use on this reach of river. We've got a bathymetry map, the blue bits being the deep bits, the red bits being the shallow bits. And, and I photoshopped this just to, for comparison on the same screen. This is a velocity map that so we can see the distribution of velocity down the river and across the river, which is a lot of great data to enable us to maybe just go fly a drone and understand that if we flew it here, for example, we're going to have a relatively shallow bed. We're going to know the cross section. We're going to have some idea of, of the relationship between surface velocity and mean channel velocity. Um, inspiration can come from anywhere. I saw this yesterday on Twitter. Um, I had some brief interactions with the folks at the ocean cleanup a couple of years ago. Um, so I follow them on Twitter, but this is, they've installed image sensors and LIDAR, interestingly, to monitor and quantify plastics flowing down a river system. I mentioned LIDAR because I'm really interested in LIDAR's potential to overcome some of the limitations in image-based measurement methods, but I haven't found anybody who's doing it in the hydrology sphere, but these guys are doing it to try and monitor plastics. So I'm trying to get in touch with them again to learn a bit more about it. Um, bringing it back to the hydrology, um, this is a piece of work led by Keith Bevan. Um, Nick Chappell is there. I think you can see him there. Um, future hydrology, they're calling this. 
Um, the messages that come out of this group that I like are around the need to improve our ability to observe, to, to do better observations. So I translate that into hydrometry is where it's at, but flow input is the biggest source of uncertainty in models. More better flow data is needed. Um, and here's some other, it's a, it's a bit wordy and complex, but basically they said they want 1% accuracy in flow data. They also say they want increments of discharge down river systems. A big challenge, but it's one that I would like to take on and try and try and work with. Uh, yeah, I'm getting near the end now, so I uh, hope you're still bearing with me. Precipitation, I think there's a lot of potential innovation to come in precipitation measurement. Uh, this is from SMHI in Sweden, and they call it micro weather. This is using cell phone links, links between cell phone towers, attenuation in the signal caused by rainfall to actually quantify rainfall in, in, in the air. So this has been live for, well, they've, they've had data since 2015, and this is a live system, and this is a screenshot from that system. So cell phone links, the benefits, you have really good coverage in areas where people live. So, you know, it can give us really dense data networks in, in places, areas of population. Um, taking the thinking a bit further, why can't we measure attenuation and signal directly to the phone and turn the phone, turn everyone's phone into a rain gauge? Um, I don't know if it's possible, but I don't see why not. So uh, then we would have an enormous amount of rainfall data. Similarly, uh, thinking outside of the box a little bit, our cars are now rain gauges. Almost every car's now got a, a rainfall sensor to turn the wipers on and off. So, you know, that's sensing rainfall, it's detecting rainfall. You could muck about with it and try and quantify. Um, just some other thinking, uh, some cars, my, my last car, had a radar sensor in, in, in the front of the car. I know researchers have used those radar sensors and again, I think it's backscatter of the signal to quantify rainfall. Clearly it's gonna be susceptible to spray and whatever on motorways, but and maybe you could do the same thing with the headlights, you know, reflected light from, from water in the air could be a method of measuring rain. Um, yeah, this again <laughs> from Twitter, I, I really, I just put this in because it's fun. If I can make it play, uh, come on, here we go. I mean, I love this, this video, but it, it just got me thinking about, you know, if we can time the cow floating down this irrigation canal, uh, maybe we can understand something about the flow. But um, really, I just liked it. I wanted to put it in for the fun sake of things. But the cow was unharmed and seemed to enjoy the experience, to be reassured to hear. Um, COVID-19, we can't ignore it, whatever we're doing. Um, the point is, suddenly we can all talk to each other. You know, who on this call would have been on this experiencing this, this, this seminar, if it had been a physical one, who knows, who can say? Um, but this is me talking to a to University of Glasgow from here in Oxfordshire, I didn't have to move, so we can all talk. Other implications of the COVID-19 crisis, maybe single person field activities are gonna become necessary. Um, we've developed a smaller remote control boat, the one on the left there, and I was able to go and use that for my last field work day for the Environment Agency, because it's smaller and lighter. Um, two people are required to move the big boat, one person can deploy the small boat. So, you know, we maybe need to start thinking, do we need tools, do we need monitoring solutions that don't need double manning if it's difficult for people to travel together? Um, with the same thought in mind, the, the radar gun, it's as big as you see, it's, it's, it's like a hairdryer, it's all you need. So single person activity with that, provided the bridge and, and where you're gonna measure from is safe, of course. Um, and the same with drones. Um, I, I put an, an arrow in here so you can even see the drone. Uh, this is my DJI Spark. Um, it's tiny, but it's all you need to do flow measurement with drones. So again, if you, know, if, if you can't travel with someone else, you need to get a measurement. Maybe a smaller, lighter, simpler tool is, is gonna be required, it's gonna be useful. Um, yeah, on the subject of learning from each other and not having to travel, EGU, Europe's biggest earth science conference, went online this year in record-breaking time. I would encourage you to look at the program for next year because whether the physical event happens or not, there will be online content. Uh, there was an awful lot of hydrometry stuff. We're growing that. So it's, it's a really useful place to learn more on advanced things. AGU, North American brother of EGU, is going to have a lot of online conference this year, whether or not it's physical as well. So look out for that. I've never been to AGU, but this year I can engage with AGU because it's online. So I'm excited about that. And we're in the closing straight now. Um, <laughs> so this was just a reminder that in the last week I have moved from an environment agency to UKCEH, a move of about 200 meters down Benson Lane in Crowmarsh. 
it was either there or, or the undertakers and, and they weren't they weren't recruiting so so ch it was um but i think it's a good change i'm i'm excited i'm happy so far um and it's and, and harry said i had to put an advert in here for for, for what we're doing but but essentially yeah we met up on monday we had a chat what are we trying to do what's this post all about what are we trying to do we're trying to put uk at the forefront of hydrometry science globally um you know there's a need there's ambition i think ceh is in a great place to do that to lead for it but i think we want to do it collaboratively we want to do it with the uk monitoring agencies the ea nrw and sepa and the irish agencies uh, but but also with universities and academia and with the global community um, so I think after that advert, all that's left is questions and for me to find out whether anybody's still there at the end of this epic, which was, yeah, I've overrun. I said I would. Sorry. Questions. That's fantastic, Nick. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. I'm sure everybody uh, would uh, agree with me on that one. Um, so, yes, just a reminder to everybody, if you've got a question, please post a summary or just a shortened version of it version of it in the chat room and I'll call you in to ask the question directly to Nick uh, and provide your name and affiliation when you do ask that question. So while people are thinking about the question, um, I'll ask one Nick. Oh, okay. So there's lots in there, there's lots in there and we've chatted over the last couple of weeks about some of these wonderful ideas and innovation. Now a lot of them are on the side of innovation at the moment and research how do you think we break through to the mainstream on some of this technology? What's needed? That's a good question. But I, I, I mean, I think what's needed is, it, well, hopefully what's needed is, is me working at CH. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, I think what's needed is, is, is a recognition that just because something works doesn't mean it's operationally effective. It's got to be simple. It's got to be user friendly. It's got to be affordable. And it's got to be safe. So I think, you know, taking where we are at present i think i i can perhaps build a, a good bridge between the research community and the monitoring agencies so i really really and i mean this very much want to keep working with the ea with sepa with nrw with everyone else to make sure the tools that we develop are useful and taking feedback you know so going back to that drone thing i'm as excited as anybody about the potential of drones for flood measurement but I also see some of the limitations. And I know, for example, when you pop the drone up in the air and you shoot video, you don't actually know at that point if you're going to be able to process it and get something meaningful from it. Sometimes it's obvious that you will when there's, when there's really clear traces in the sense of the river, but often it's not. And Mark's online surface velocity league has really helped us understand that. But I don't think it would be difficult to overcome that problem. What you need is to put the drone in the air and what we need is a piece of software that just says, yes, we can detect motion. It doesn't need to do all the scaling and quantification. It just needs to say, yes. So you move the drone up river, you move it down river, the vectors appear, vectors disappear. And then you know where to collect your data. So simple, little things like that, but we need to be critical. You know, when a tool isn't what we want, when we're confused by it, you know, we've, we've got to be open and honest about that and say, hey, I don't understand this. It needs to be simplified. Super. So does, does that kind of answer the question? It does. It does. Thank you. Okay, we've got some questions coming in. So over to Roger Bailey, if you can unmute and Roger ask Bailey, questions, Nick. Hello, Nick. You thought I'd have to ask you a question. So, uh, yeah, great presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I suppose the, the thing for me there, how are you going to measure the cross sections from well, space or certainly remotely? I felt perhaps there wasn't a lot of uh, information on how that cross section is being measured. But otherwise, it was really, yeah, inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, OK, well, that, it's a good question. I think, I mean, in the case of flooding, often we're going to be talking about flows that are outside of the normal confines of the channel. So, you know, often that's going to come from LIDAR data, which I know we have LIDAR data for the whole of the UK. I don't know at this stage how readily available LIDAR data is for, for the world, but I think elevation data is going to be available for, suitable for big floods. Um, what Mark Randall is doing in Australia, he's using his drone to do the valve symmetry, but he's also using structure from motion. So this is photogrammetry. So he flies his drone over the area of interest and, and takes hundreds of overlapping photographs. And from those overlapping photographs, he can build up a really detailed 3D model of the river channel. Now his river channels tend to be either dry or 10 or 15 meters deep. So that works really, really nicely for him. 
but we could use the same approach in the UK and elsewhere. And then for the flowing section, assuming there is a flowing section, it doesn't dry up like, like marks. Um, ADCPs, you know, ADCPs have great potential. One of the reasons, you know, for showing some of these slides a bit further back, how many slides back was it? But, um, you know, the slides of, of the river mapping is because I think the future has to be for us, <laughs> too many slides. You know, the future has to be for us to move towards a situation where we've got maps of our rivers, that one there. So, you know, if we've got maps like this of our rivers, and we, I mean, we have bathymetry for the whole of the Thames from our geomatics group at the Environment Agency, or the Environment Agency does, I've got to stop saying we, um, you know, and we can analyze our ADCP data to understand the velocity relationship between the surface and, and mean channel velocity. And it tends to fit within a range anyway. It tends to, the velocity relationship, the multiplier tends to be between 0.75 and about one. So you, you take your surface velocity and you multiply it by one down to 0.75 according to the river conditions. But we can learn about that by analyzing pre-existing ADCP data. So yeah, I didn't have time to go into it, Rog. You're absolutely right. It's a really key question, but I think it's, it's relatively simple to do, I think. Thanks. All right. Okay, thanks both. Next question is from Summit Sen from India. Summit, do you want to unmute? Sure. Thank you, Nick, for a nice presentation. Uh, my quick question is like, uh, what are the accuracy in terms of like, when we talk about non-contact discharge estimation or ADCP using ADCP in the rivers, which are very heavily like in a flood condition, you have sediment laden rivers. Sorry, just you uh, accuracy of ADCP data in, in flooding rivers? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, asking like uh, the discharge estimation using the non-contact as well as ADCPs, how good they are in the sediment, uh, sediment laden rivers. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, the sediment loading shouldn't make any difference to the non-contact methods. It's gonna be a question of, as Roger says, you know, defining the cross section. And I suppose in a particularly sediment laden river, you might, you may have a, a, an active morphology. You might have channel change during the event, but that is difficult to quantify and understand. So that if that's happening, that would be a source of uncertainty. But assuming you've got a stable cross section, Mark Randall and others who've been practicing these methods for, for quite some time, once they've got a reasonable understanding of, of their surface velocity coefficient, they're getting results within, I mean, you saw from that table, the results are within typically the, the first five results from the, from the exercise that Mark did online were typically within about 5% of the ADCP measurement. And the ADCP measurements, we, we believe, are you know, as good a reference as we can get, short of building a, a big flow control structure or something of that nature. So ADCP, the, the quality of the ADCP measurement itself can be degraded during a, a period when there's excessive sediment in the water. It's not common in the UK. I've only seen it once. Um, more commonly, the problem is, is coming from that surface interface. If you've got a very choppy surface to the river, um, the ADCP bounces in and out of the water. It can it can try and dive, uh, and you can have problems related to that. But um, but if if all is good, your ADCP measurement should be within five percent. You know, perhaps ten percent. Some of the bigger sources of uncertainty are going to be out of bank flows uh, and this kind of thing. So uh, I mean, do you see problems with your ADCPs? Are they are they struggling to punch through heavy, heavy sediment laden rivers? I don't have ADCP right now, but I'm just because like we are in India, uh, some of the, our main agency, the hydromet, uh, the agency which measures the discharges in rivers, CWC, they are going into a lot of non-contact discharge estimation techniques, but but still our rivers are quite a bit, some rivers are sedimentated. So that that was my question, like, yeah, how good yeah, that was? I think the ADCP is going to be your reference instrument. Okay. And then you'll Thank use you. the surface velocity methods for the times when you, you know, you want to work more effectively, you know, more, more efficiently or, or when you can't get a measurement of your ADCP. Uh, but they should work very well together, I think. Thank you. Okay. Next question is from uh, Elizabeth Jameson. Liz, hey. Hi. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thank you for that great presentation, Nick. Um, so as you know, but for the benefit of everyone else, um, I work in a very operational um, setting 
um, with our National Hydrological Services in Canada. And my question for you is how you see the role of a typical field hydrologist or hydrographer as we adopt more tools and a greater variety of tools. Some of those tools are for niche, you know, hard to measure scenarios like you described in your presentation. Um, how how do we adopt that into our into our daily operations um, just because do we expect these people to have expert knowledge and training on now a wider variety of tools mm, yeah it's, it's a really good question and it sort of comes back to what i think was my the first question wasn't it really this i think it, it's a question for me it's a question of making the tools simple i think it you know i, I i've spent you know, I spent 33 years doing hydrometry at the Environment Agency. And throughout that period, I think it became a more interesting, more rewarding, but more demanding job. You know, as we move from current meters to ADCPs and understanding the setup of ADCPs and the quality of the data and different deployment methods and moving towards some of these new tools, it becomes more demanding. It, it certainly does. So I think it will get more difficult. I think you know one of the reasons I, I I throw a lot of this it's really important stuff in is to try to you know we, we do need good quality staff to come and do this because it's important and so it's to try to you know to gain recognition that this, this just doesn't need to be some somebody once said of a hydrometry team oh you're not just bucket chuckers which was one of the most alarming things you know was this sense that really there were very unskilled people and that's not the case at all and I think it's getting more and more the case so I think having experts, you know, within organizations, and I know you have a great deal of expertise over at Environment Canada, you know, having experts to lead stuff, but being really, being awkward about making things simple, I think is really important. And with, and with ADCPs, you know, they've made the amount of knowledge you need, you, you need more knowledge, but at the same time, the trend is to try to simplify the operation of the tool to make it more automatic, you know, have all, more automatic configuration you still need the expert to make sure the auto config is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think with, you know, with the surface velocity, with the video processing, it's kind of transitional. I was really excited by the hydro stiff software mm -hmm. when Mark shared it, that finally I, was, I had a hallelujah moment. Well, this is now relatively simple, but I think processing the files he shared, I could see the shortcomings in the data collection side then, because, you know, some of them processed easily and some of them didn't. And I think we need handholding on that because, particularly with something like drones, which is the sensitivity around their use, potential risk around their use. If you go out the first few times and you don't get anything meaningful, you don't want people to be put off or, if, you know, heaven forbid, if the thing crashes and causes, you know, so if you can make sure you're going to get something meaningful, but, but yeah, I think people are going to need more, more knowledge, but, but we have to be demanding. And I think that's why there's such an important role at the interface between science and research and operational um, science, which is, which is, I think, what our little group has tried to, to oversee and, and what I hope to continue to do. Okay, thanks. All right. Yep. Thanks both. Next question goes to somebody who gave me my first opportunity in hydrometry, uh, Mr. Dave Stewart. Dave Good to see Stewart. you, Dave. Hi, Joe. Dave. Hello there, Mick. Um, very, very uh, good presentation, up to your usual high standards. Congratulations. Thank you. I've got a feeling that uh, you may have provided the answer to my question in your uh, answer to Roger earlier on. But um, So you go out and you carry out a flow measurement, the uh, highest flow measurement ever made on a river using a, a surface water flow measurement technique. And I'm just wondering, you're probably basing your uh, uh, calculating the cross-sectional mean velocity based on previous gaugings by EDCP or, or possibly some other method. And I'm just wondering, uh, how confident are you in this or the extrapolation from those lower discharges, the relationship between surface water and mean velocity in the cross-section uh, to when you go to a significantly higher flow? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And I think the answer, the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, I mean, I think once the water gets out of banks, you know, there are certain things that, that, that will change that velocity relationship from being something fairly predictable to being relatively unpredictable. So I, I did some analysis of during the flooding of 2013-14, we gauged the lower Thames every day 
for a, for a week or so with our ADCPs and our arc boats. And, and I analyzed the data and I, and I thought, well, if I only had a surface velocity reading, how much error would I have if I, if I, if I just took the, the, the surface coefficient from day one ADCP gauging and applied it to day two, day three, day four, four five, six. And, and the answer was on the Thames, very little error at all because the velocity, the velocity relationship was so, was so consistent. If, however, you've got a situation where you've got significant out of bank flows, you've got other factors like bridges influencing things, the uncertainty is going to be a lot greater. So I think what really what we need to do is get a piece of research undertaken to analyze the tens of thousands of ADCP gauges we've got to understand that velocity profile. But we need to recognize absolutely what I think you're probably hinting at, that we will have a relatively small number of perhaps relatively low quality compared to the others of the extreme flow measurements to, uh, to properly understand that relationship. There are some other subtleties in this as well. Like, for example, you're gonna have a very different relationship if let's say you've got the rivers flooding all over the floodplain. So take the example of the screenshot you can see at the moment. You know, you're gonna have a very different relationship when you're collecting data over the river to what you're gonna have if you're, if you're taking your measurement over the field. So I think we're gonna to have to learn quite a lot about this. Um, but just to, just to sort of give you an idea of, of the constraints that people tend to put on this, the, the French um, have been using surface velocity methods for, for a lot longer than we have. And they have a delightfully simple um, kind of method of, of applying a surface velocity coefficient. They say, if you've got a very rough surface, you apply a surface velocity coefficient of around 0.75. If it's a pretty smooth surface, say like the Thames, um, 0.95, something in between 0.85 and if you know nothing else 0.85 and, and it often works out really well Andrew Booth did some analysis of, of data that he had up in, in Cumbria and he just used 0.85 and, and he was almost spot on each time so it absolutely needs more research there are some sort of defined constraints and I love the simplicity of what they what they're using in France um, but yeah it can potentially be a big source of uncertainty I think again, you know, if we can get this detailed bathymetry, so whether it comes from structure from motion or from LIDAR, to inform our understanding of bed roughness and other factors more effectively, then we can we can improve this. So yeah, learning about our velocity profiles is is, is kind of important. I hope that kind of answers your, your question. Okay, thanks both. I've got two final questions for you, Nick. Uh, uh -huh. the penultimate one is from Tasif Ahmed. Tasif, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, doctor. Just I want to ask. Hi, doctor. Hi. Hello, doctor. Yeah, good afternoon. Now, just I wanted to ask, what is the accuracy of the uh, with uh, this radar when we are measuring the velocity? The accuracy of the radar. Sorry, you're quite quiet. The radar. Yeah. What is the accuracy? What is the accuracy when we are measuring the velocity? Uh, so what is, what is the uh, accuracy when we are measuring with velocity and with other methods? Yeah. When we compare the, this, when we compare this. With the radar, and, the accuracy was, was very good. I did have a slide that it illustrated some comparative Oh, hang on. Have you just lost my display? Sorry. Um, sorry, uh, it's probably best I just talk. Um, yeah, we did some analysis where we could um, direct velocity to velocity comparisons um, with the surface velocity radar. And, and it compared really well, provided the conditions were suited to it. So what it needs to work well, it needs a rough surface, but it needs, but crucially, it needs the rough surface to be moving with the flow. So what it doesn't like is, this is, this is quite important learning actually, it, it doesn't like standing waves and, and the image based systems are the same. If you've got fixed structures on the surface like a standing wave that's not moving with the flow, it will bias low. But if you've got a, a rough surface that's moving with the flow, we, we find that the results are very, very good, very comparable, you know, within a few percent. Okay, thank you, doctor. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. And the final question I'm going to have to read out because Nell Rainey is, is uh, probably multitasking and can't speak. So the question is, with regards to measuring flow during storms, does the impact of raindrops falling onto the surface 
affect the accuracy of image-based vel velocimetry? Ooh, and does this okay. differ between optical, thermal, and radar? Yeah. There's a question to finish on. That's a really interesting one. And I, I think it raises, it, it, that question itself raises a lot of questions. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think it, the answer really is I don't know. Um, and, and I'd invite Liz or anyone else who thinks they know to leap in and <laughs> try and answer it for me. But, but I, obviously they're going to introduce roughness to the surface that, that the camera or the radar would be able to get a signal from. But whether they immediately start moving at the speed of the surface or not, is something that would require a bit of investigation. As for the thermal method, one of the things we've been considering is, so the, the videos I showed you, I know it was a very high spec camera um, and whether it's prohibitively expensive or not, we don't know. But something that's of a great deal of interest is, is potentially using much cheaper cameras, but using a thermal tracer. So in other words, something, you know, imagine a hose pipe stretched across the river with holes in it. If you could drip water in from that hose pipe, which was of a very different temperature to the water in the river, for a short period, we believe you would see the drops of water moving with the flow. I honestly don't know. I, I assume they would very rapidly pick up and, and move at the same speed as, as the water, but I haven't seen any research into that. So I think what you've done, as far as I'm concerned, is identify a really interesting and necessary bit of research that, that can help us to, to understand limitations of existing methods, but potentially improve the potential of new methods. I don't know, Liz, Just do, you had a comment. On that? do you have any thoughts on that, if you're still there? Um, yeah, and I just, I see that Mark has chimed in and he'd be more of an expert, um, that it can help um, imagery. Maybe Mark wants to... Is Mark here? Hi, Mark. Hey, Nick. There's way more about this <laughs> stuff than I do. Come on, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sitting quietly listening. <laughs> there he is. Uh, yeah, uh, no, we actually find um, heavy rainfall does actually help with the, the imagery analysis on the water. So, um, yeah, really does help improve things. We find it creates some really nice little traces but as it hits. Um, so, yeah, certainly not an issue. Excellent. Gosh, it's a good thing I didn't know you were there, Mark. I'd have, I'd have been nervous referencing <laughs> so much of your work. I hope I said nice things, mate. <laughs> no, it was, it was a good presentation, it was. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, wow. Mark's, Mark's calls us from Queensland and Australia, so that's, that's pretty exciting. But yeah, thanks. So do you know if anyone's done any research into it though, Mark? I mean, other than your observations, is, is there anything published or has anybody- Not so specifically to do with rainfall, no. No. Um, so yeah, it, it would be an area to look into, but yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, certainly it's, it's not something that we've, we with our heavy wet season have um, yeah, really found any dramas with, so. Yeah. Um, I've got a quick question for you, Nick, and I hope you don't mind, but how long, um, how long do you think it's going to take the UK to start embracing these methodologies as a standard procedure? Um, in Australia here, we're just actually getting ready to launch our um, national industry guidelines for adoption nationwide. So for the imagery and radar. So just wondering. Yeah, yeah. My standard answer to every question so far is that's a really good question. And um, Mark, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think we have been, well, we've been a little slower than I, I would have liked in doing so. I, I, I think what it, the issue is resourcing really. I think what we need is, is, is adequate resource to move things forward. Now I know there's interest in doing that. Uh, and I know the Environment Agency has been striving to try and find some resource to do that. But has, but has not been able to, to, to properly resource that so far. Um, so, you know, my hope is that through my position at CEH, if I can help advance them, these methods and bring them into our monitoring, I would like to do so. So, I mean, I think the surface velocity radar, because of its simplicity and ease of use, I think that, that you know, that's got, this is ready to go written all over it. And we should start making wider use of that in the monitoring agencies. As for the drone-based stuff, I'd be disappointed if we don't feel confident enough to start collecting the videos, particularly given the ease of use of the HydraStiff software. But, but I am keen for us to overcome some of these operational limitations to ensure that it, that it works well for us. So, you know, I, I, maybe I should come out and say in this, in this session, 
I want us to be using these within two years. I mean, I, I really do, but I think it, it does rely upon available resource to work with us in the monitoring agencies, you know, to make sure that the tools are effective for their use. Um, and yeah, perhaps it needs you to come back home, Mark, back to the UK and, and, and drive it for us. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But is there any coordinated effort, you know, from your experience and from the community, you know, to help countries who are where we are to transition? Because, I mean, you've, you've done an awesome job of doing it in Australia, but I don't know whether it's happening all across Australia or just in your patch. But, you know, if we, if the whole point is we should be learning from each other. I know Canada, I think, are slightly ahead of us, but perhaps not as far advanced as you are but if we can if we can help different agencies to learn the best way to go from a standing start to making good use of these then i would like to see that happen yeah i think uh, just getting out there and starting using it and having that support um yeah, we're starting to go nationwide with people talking to me uh, and wanting advice and, and i'm advising them how to set up their own sites and how to start using this um, but again, I went across, you know, 18 months ago to New Zealand and provided them with the training over there and uh, now they're really running with it. So, um, I think, yeah, getting in there and getting, getting dirty, start using it, uh, and demonstrating to the powers that be that, look, this is a great method that, um, yeah. yeah. I, think, I mean, tragically we were robbed of our, of our great opportunity this year, which was going to be the surface forces workshop that was scheduled to happen at Hull earlier this year. And we are thinking now about whether we can run that as some in some sort of online form so I'll, I'll talk to you about that but but you know I think that would have been a, a you know a fairly big step in terms of increasing knowledge increasing awareness and moving us towards operational use of it but, but yeah let's let's work together on it Mark yeah I'll have it I'll uh, catch up with you soon have a chat and we'll see what we can do yeah. brilliant Okay, do we have time for any more or is that, is that, is that our time? I, I've over, overstayed my welcome probably already. <laughs> it's absolutely it's fine, Nick. Time. Thank you. Um, I think we'll draw a line under the questions there. Uh, that's the last of the questions.